Yeah. So, um, yeah. What did you think? That was really good. Uh, I thought it was really dark. I loved, um, I loved the way it was shot. Uh, there was actually a moment um, pretty early on in the film. I want to say maybe like, hmm, like half hour into it, something like that, of, um, of you know some kind of vegetation like under the water, kind of flowing under the water. I was like, ooh. This director has seen Tarkovsky, and he likes. <laughs> that was exactly Tark what I thought of. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Like he he likes Tarkovsky's sort of weeds in the water shots. Yeah. But um, yeah, it was it was a great film. You know, I haven't. It's weird. Like I haven't read Lord of the Flies. Um, and clearly this has you know a lot of Lord of the Flies influence. Um. I have read. There's a novel by Marianne Wiggins called John Dollar. Mm -hmm. which is a kind of Lord of the Flies with girls. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that's a, a very, very good book. I think I've actually taught that book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know I've taught that book. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, it was just really watching it. I was just thinking the whole time how important it is that children have not just father figures and mother figures, but that they have um, some kind of moral guidance. Because if they don't, it uh, it doesn't end well. Yeah, for and um, well for the people around them. Um, have you read *A Long Way Gone* by Ishmael Bea? Or I have not. I know what it is. Yeah, yeah. It, the scenes I was thinking of that book when in the scenes where I can't remember. Uh, what it what uh, I can't remember his name, but um, one of the one of the kids um, sort of breaks off from the group and ends up. It happens late in the film. He breaks off from the group and he and he accidentally ends up with this like just family who are just. Yeah, that was Rambo, I think. Yeah, Rambo. Um, and uh, and that whole scene reminded me of a long way gone because at the at the in the last part of that book, it's all about how difficult it is for. Ishmael to just readjust to normal life after being a child soldier. I mean, yeah. adjusting to normal life after the military is hard, whether you're a child soldier or, or an adult soldier. But when you're a child, you're literally like in your formative years and, you know, all these things that can. And um, so I was thinking about that during that whole sequence where he was there. And then, of course, it was all sort of cut off and we were sort of left with a very ambiguous <laughs> idea of what might happen to him. Um, yeah, what did you make of the ending? Uh, you know, with the, the the helicopter pilots talking to command, and you know, and the boy looking right into the camera. Um, I thought it was really fascinating how you know the pilots were like, "What should we do with the person?" It's just like, "Well, he's obviously take him back to fucking base, man!" Like, yeah. and then figure it out. Like, you're not going to drop him out of the chopper, but, I mean, I but just like the they were worried about the person. They they were like, who we should do to be do with this unknown person? I'm like, yeah, exactly. Unknown child maybe would be a better way of referring to it. Yes, because obviously the people. I, I just thought it was so them. bizarre how you know we have these we these military figures at the end in the helicopter, who even though they're not child soldiers and they're you know they're the military force of their state, <clears> it was still it was like they couldn't think for themselves. You know, I mean, it was just, it was just bizarre to me. And, uh, but I mean, not surprising either because yeah. that's I mean, just how it works. I mean, you see that uh, messenger character, he doesn't have a name, but just the messenger guy. Um, and just how uh, intensely he sort of drills the kids at the beginning, or at least it's implied that he intensely drills them, even though we only see like one scene of it. But, um, but you know, that sort of um, mindless obedience is kind of, um, instilled in them although i guess the kids didn't entirely internalize it because you know part of the way through the film they sort of all just rebel together and everything sort of lose, loses its ship but um but yeah and so i found the doctor character i guess she turned out to be an engineer i found her really mm -hmm. fascinating yeah i love that scene where she strangled the little girl in the in the river with the chain i was just like yeah kill that bitch kill that little bitch but um oh, yeah no she was <laughs> what's that um but uh no i i found her fascinating too that actress was in so kelly and i watched a movie about a week ago 
on Disney Plus called Togo that has Willem Dafoe in it. And it's a true story. And it takes place like in the early 1920s or the late teens in Alaska. And it's about a guy who runs sled dogs. And he takes his sled team to, there's a diphtheria outbreak. And there's a huge storm coming. And he takes his uh, sled team to go get the vaccine, to, to go get the cure. And she plays, that actress plays Willem Dafoe's uh, wife. And when Kelly and I were watching uh, Togo, I was like, God, that actress looks really, really familiar. You know, who is she? So I looked her up on IMDb. And I didn't, I wasn't able to pinpoint, I, maybe I didn't look through her filmography far enough, but I wasn't able to pinpoint what I had seen her in before. But I, I did see that she was in this movie that you and I were getting to watch, getting ready to watch. And I was like, well, that's really odd because I know it's, it's not an American film. Mm-hmm. Um, so I thought that was peculiar that this actress that I was curious about a week ago turned out to be in this movie. Um, yeah. Uh, but I thought, I thought she was interesting because she sort of seems to at the beginning try to show compassion for these child soldiers, or at least one of them, um, in that scene that takes place underground where she yeah. um, tries to show compassion. Um, but then she sort of ends up just out of like self-preservation having to um, just sort of, you know, uh, somehow get herself out of that mindset and like literally strangle one of them. And then- It was the same girl. What? Yeah, yeah. And then yeah, abandon another tough. one who was tied, the, the one who was tied up. Um, and I thought that that was just a fascinating story because um, like, you know, it's easy to sympathize with her um, with the doctor very early on, just because of the situation, because I think she acts, she gives a really good performance too. Um, and then she does that, and it made, it sort of complicated my feelings personally, I guess, even though I know that, like, again, like, what else was she supposed to do still? It's like seeing a grown woman strangling a child is a little hard to swallow, but like, again, like, I, like, again, yeah. So I thought that yeah, her, she, her she story, had no choice, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and so her story was very um, complicated, I guess, and yeah. A um, couple of the things I liked, I really liked a lot about her story, actually, was one, one of the, oh, my alarm's going off on my phone, sorry. Uh, one of the things was how we were able to, and I didn't pick up on this until about halfway through the film, but we were able to kind of ascertain just how long she had been held captive by the roots of her hair growing out. So her hair was dyed red. And at the very beginning of the film, um, there's just like this little line of gray. It's so little, in fact, that I didn't actually think it was her roots growing out. I just thought it was like her hairline or the, like the part, the natural part. But then as, as we see her held captive for longer and longer, that little sort of line of gray gets wider and wider on her hair and then by the end um after she has strangled the girl and you see her i mean there's it's mostly gray in there and um and i just thought that was a very interesting way to give the viewer an idea of how long this was going on yeah and then the scene where um she's in the bunker with the girl the scene that you mentioned i thought what was really interesting about that scene was when she initially starts talking to the girl like i didn't really read compassionate at all i i totally read self-interest and calculation she was trying to take the girl into her confidence you know in a in an effort to to kind of put the girl on her wrong foot and and get away but then once the explosions happened and you know everybody was disoriented and the girl had no longer had the gun and they were huddled against the wall together um what i thought was really interesting about that was i, I felt like the doctor switched switched gears like almost like her instincts her maternal instincts kicked in and when she kissed the girl on top of the head, there was nothing sexual about it or anything like that. It was, it was literally like she was trying to protect the girl. And then when the girl then in turn flips it and starts kissing her on the, the, the cheek and on the ear and on the neck and everything like that to try to, I mean, God knows what the girl was doing. Um, but then when she pulls away and just starts laughing at her, I was like, God, what a crazy, strange scene. Yeah. Um, there was just a lot going on in that scene. Yeah, yeah. And um, something that struck me in that scene too was um, that uh, um, 
it seems like it, it it plays with the fact that this is a child sort of so like basically what she it seems like you could read the scene in one way in that she played a childish prank on on the doctor sort of and then was yeah. giggling like a little kid right but on the other hand she's literally holding a gun to her face you know um and uh i don't know i thought that the sort of um I don't know. Unsettling contrast between those two was very interesting in that scene. I guess. Um, and I didn't realize how young that little girl was. I think her character's name was Swede. I didn't realize how young she actually was until after that scene. Um, so maybe that was like the next time that we saw her in the jungle, or maybe it was like, you know, when the children had been relocated to the rainforest, to the jungle. Um, and we, you know, see all the kids kind of in their underwear and their tops and everything like that. Um, and you just see how undeveloped some of them are physically. Yeah. And I particularly noticed that girl and I was like, my God, she's probably freaking 12 or 13 or something like this. And so for her to have had that scene with the doctor where she was manipulating the doctor in some way, you know, and trying to, it was weird. It was, it was weird because I, I feel like the doctor was trying to get the girl to trust her for selfish reasons and then the explosion happened and then when the doctor is literally genuinely trying to comfort the girl the girl tries to kind of lull her in with the the kind of sexual overture and um so for yeah so for a child of, of the age that that character clearly was um to do something like that to to read a situation like that and then to flip it i thought was was really fascinating yeah yeah, you know, I remember at the very beginning of that scene, the doctor was wrapped in a blanket, I think. And yeah. And um she there was like a hole in the front of the blanket and she was like I think her hands were there. And at first I remember that it was, it was weird. It looked like she had no arms. It well, what I noticed was that it looked like there was this like black hole in her chest at first. And at first I was like is there like a growing black hole on her chest? Like what's happening to her? And I was like oh, it's her hands. Um but it, I don't know whether that was intent. I'm guessing that was intentional, but I don't know. But like that might um, sort of uh, support your uh, feeling that she was being, you know, sort of manipulative and self, self, you know, self interested in that scene. Um, but anyway, yeah, that was an interesting scene. Hmm. Yeah, it was a cool movie. I, um, you know, I haven't I haven't looked up the actors in it or anything like that. And I mean, I doubt I've seen those kids in anything because they're all so damn young in this. But um, the kid who played Bigfoot, the one who was um, given charge of the group after the cow was killed and the other boy committed suicide, um, Kelly Kelly's like unloading the dishwasher and just listening to us talk, and she's giving me these looks like, oh my god, like what the fuck did you guys watch? Um, but anyway, but the kid who played Bigfoot. He had such a striking face. Like I know I've never seen him in anything before, but I feel like I've seen him in things before. I, would, I feel like I've seen a number of other films where actors who have his look have been cast. Yeah. Um, just because there's just... And um, I mean, I can't think of who these actors might be. And it, it could even be that I have never actually seen anyone who looks exactly like him, but there was just something about his air on screen that I feel like I've seen in a lot of other films. Um, you know, like for instance, uh, the one that I was thinking about most while watching this was Amoros Peros. I don't know if you've seen that. It's from the guy who made Birdman and Gravity. Oh, okay. And one of his first, it might've actually been his first film. I can't remember. But, uh, but there's just something so, it takes place in Mexico, Mexico City and there's something really raw about that film. And that kid's look just reminded me of that movie a lot for some reason. I, I was watching um, Mark Kermode's review of this film on, on YouTube. Oh, I love Mark Kermode. Yeah, and um, he mentioned that there were some seasoned actors among like a lot of the child children are played by like very, obviously very new actors, but he did mention that a couple, there were a couple seasoned actors among them. So he might be, maybe he wasn't a film that you saw. I'm going to look him up real quick. 
What's Bessie doing? Is she giving you giving She's having you hell? evening hissy fit? <laughs> I don't what? know what happens to her, but like in the evenings after I feed her and everything, she just like gets very like on edge and grumpy for a while and then settles down and goes to sleep when I go to sleep. <laughs> that sounds like Blue. Yeah, that sounds like Blue. Blue is like the moodiest cat of all time, I swear. All right, I'm looking up the the actors. All right, so there's the guy. Maybe I have seen him because he is one of the only uh, of the child actors. Most of them don't even have pictures in their IMDb credits, but he does. <clears throat> and he was in Ender's Game, which I have seen. He's in 41 things. He was in Ender's Game, which I've seen. What else was he in? Uh, God, he's been in a lot of stuff. That'd be weird if, if I have actually seen, uh, like maybe if he was in A Moral's Perils or something like that, that would be, because that movie came out a long time ago. Um, no, that's the only film of, of his that I've seen is Ender's Game. But he's been in a lot of stuff. He was in the remake of Ben-Hur that came out a couple of years ago. Uh, he was in this movie called The Stanford Prison Experiment. Oh, yeah. Which supposed to be really good and it's supposed that. to be really yeah. good. But, uh, but yeah, so he was in that. Huh. Anyway. I, I saw the Stanford Prison Experiment. Huh. I didn't is it good? It. Uh, it was pretty good, yeah. yeah. It's a uh, true story, isn't it? It's a true story, although that study, ha that study is always cited and it actually is a very flawed study. Um, yeah, I know a fair amount about it because, you know, it's my field. But, yeah. You're a psychology guy. Yeah. Um, if we ever watch it together, I can give you a spiel about the problems with that study. But it is a good movie, so. Gotcha. Um, yeah. Do the filmmakers of Stanford Prison Experiment, did they acknowledge that it was a flawed study, like maybe in the titles at the end or something like this? No, no, um, no. <laughs> um, no, they, 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 they made a good movie, but, um, and you know, I don't think most people outside of academic psychology would know about the criticism of, of that experiment. I mean, people have tried to repeat it uh, in some, one way or another, and it hasn't turned out the way that it turned out there. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, there are criticisms of the fact that there was no, there was no kind of, um, there was no control condition, basically. You know, in experiments, you have the experimental condition, the control condition. There was no control condition to compare these boys to. Um, oh, gotcha. There's a lot about sort of what Philip Zimbardo, the psychologist, did to sort of egg them on throughout the study, and uh, there's some speculation that maybe he did more to to cause the crazy behavior than he lets on. But yeah, hmm. so yeah. but it's a good movie, so <laughs> whatever. Um, but uh, so. Um, yeah, uh, you know, one unfortunate thing about watching Monos was yeah. that one, well, it wasn't about Monos. It was about the fact that I read on its Wikipedia page that it was influenced by Come and See, which I've just seen recently. Um, mm -hmm. And um, <coughs> is that accurate, do you feel? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, in fact, the whole sequence with the cow at the beginning and the shooting of the cow, that scene, I, I'd be willing to bet that that's like a direct reference to Come and See. There's a whole hmm. scene, there's a whole sequence with a cow in a field in Come and See. Um, and, uh, and also like, Come and See is full of all this like um, very unsettling, surreal imagery. Um, um, and uh, I feel like the director here was trying to, in, to, to do a similar thing. Um, even like, I guess the pig comes from the Lord of the Flies, but that almost seemed come and see esque as well. But, um, um, but yeah, anyway. Um, and the I wonder if they, insane. What, what's that? The soundtrack was insane. Yeah, it was a very, it was a very bizarre. It reminded me actually a little bit of the score from uh, the movie we watched last week. So, in The Lobster, in The Favorite, and in The Killing of a Sixth Gear, Yorgos Lanthimos, his soundtracks are really, really like atonal. Mm -hmm. And really, it's, it's not so much music as it is just kind of sound that's designed to put you on edge. Yeah. And I felt like this soundtrack was very similar. 
mm -hmm. in that way. And it did a really good job of that, of making you feel um, a kind of sense of dread or ominousness, which was effective. Yeah. Yeah, I thought it was really effective. Yeah, it, it was another, I, another similarity to come and see, I have to say. Um, and the reason I was saying it was unfortunate that I thought of come and see throughout this thing was because I kept comparing it to come and see, which is like not very fair because come and see is one of the greatest films of all time. And here I am comparing this, this newbie film to, to it. But, um, um, but like the soundtrack of come and see is also very much like, um, it like actually like, cause there are planes, bomber planes in come and see and like the soundtrack like mixes in with the sound of a plane going overhead. And uh, it also sort of blends in with the um, uh, ringing in the ears after after you've been, just been close to a bomb. And it's, it's a really cool soundtrack, but it reminded me of that too. Um, and like, because this one, the soundtrack here I thought was really cool how it like combined the sounds from their, uh, their bird sounds that they use as signals along with like mm -hmm. other stuff. Um, yeah. Uh, I was really, I was uh, really surprised at the end there. Um, when the the kids had found Rambo, like when Rambo wakes up and he comes out of his out of the room that he's been sleeping in, and he sees the the man and the woman of the house in the kitchen, and they've got rifles, and I'm just like, what the fuck is going on? And uh, and I love that the filmmaker didn't give you <coughs> enough time to think about it. You know, just as you're starting to think, like, what's happening here? they're shot and they just fall down dead. And, um, you know, and then he runs out and then there's the chase. And um, so, yeah, I, th I thought it was a very effective, uh, a really, really effective film. Yeah. You know, I love that it, uh, there wasn't a ton of setup with it. Like it dropped you right into the camp. Yeah. And, um, and really the only setup there was, was this guy who's kind of their drill sergeant or whatever. And, um, but, uh, Oh, you're playing laser. Yeah. Kelly's playing with, with the cat. Um, but so it, it's, it's a little bit like what I was talking about with, with uh, Wolf Hall uh, in my, I think it was my first video on Wolf Hall back in January, where I talk about how Hillary Mantel trusts her reader enough to just drop them into that world and not give them any sort of backstory exposition mm -hmm. and just let them find their bearings. And I felt like this filmmaker did a pretty good job of that too. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciate that as a viewer I appreciate being trusted by a filmmaker. Yeah. And I hate when I see movies that kind of just spoon feed me things like in case you didn't get it, this is what that meant. Mm -hmm. And I hate when novels do that too. Um, I don't know if you've read Haruki Murakami, but his novel Kafka on the Shore does that in spades and it drove me insane. Like it yeah. just, oh, it just drove me nuts. Like he just, he, he was doing all of this stuff with um, Sophocles, with the Oedipus myth. And he just didn't trust his readers to get it. And so when he would make some kind of point or something like this, two pages later, a character would explain what all of that meant, just in case we as readers didn't get it. And he did it again and again and again in that book. And it's I just like, resented the hell it's out of like, it. It's like if in Killing of a Sacred Deer, when they brought up the essay that the daughter had written about uh, Euripides's uh, tragedy of Iphig Iphigenia, it would be like if a few scenes later, uh, that essay was read out to us. <laughs> yeah, or explained. Yeah, like if the father was like, can you, can you tell me what this play is about that she wrote about? And then the prince would be, oh, okay, well, here's what it was. <laughs> exactly. And I hate it when filmmakers and novelists do that. Um, and a lot of them do, even a lot of ones with really great reputations, and I just don't get it. I just don't understand. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it would be exactly that kind of thing. Exactly mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Yeah. And I mean, we're not even really given, we don't, I mean, I looked at the Wikipedia page even, I, I don't have any idea of what kind of conflict this is a part of or. Yeah. I don't know what country is set in. in. Yeah. We don't, we aren't given really any sort of exposition. It's just, and it, it's all, any exposition would kind of be beside the point. Right. I mean, like, yeah, that's, it's, the point is to look at how these soldiers behave and how the woman, uh, the doctor behaves or the engineer um, and stuff. And so it's all just superfluous and he knows that. And um, yeah. yeah. Well, it's a little bit like, you know, what you're saying there reminds me a little bit of um, 1917 
and how there were there were a lot of well not a lot but some viewers and some critics groused at the fact that 1917 focused so closely on just these soldiers instead of you know giving us more about sort of the you know the dynamics of the you know the the battle landscape and who was fighting who and what were they fighting for and it's just like that's not that story mm -hmm. it's this story it's a small intimate thing and you just you sign on for it or you don't yeah. and uh and again with this you know those those critics uh who were all pissed off that 1917 didn't sort of paint a broader picture would probably watch this and be like well what conflict is this what country are they in like what are they fighting for mm -hmm. um and it's just that they're missing the point i mean that's not the point the point is the experience of it yeah um yeah. not that it makes sense to us i mean in some ways it's not supposed to make sense i mean these are children who were you know killing each other and killing other people and and um yeah it's just it's just madness you know it's just this kind of microcosm um you know that's designed to explore what happens to kids when they're completely untethered and they have they have no one to look up to and no one to guide them mm -hmm. and uh and it's kind of terrifying yeah, yeah it's kind of terrifying yeah Okay, so I was going to ask you about the cow. Because, so in America, right, and, and you know, in, in most of the Western world, I know in, in the UK and, and I think in Australia, et cetera, et cetera, laws are in place now and have been in place for a very long time now that animals are not allowed to be harmed in the making of a movie. But in other, in, I, I feel like there are certain countries in the world still that don't have those mm -hmm. laws. And whenever I see something like, I mean, we don't see the cow shot in the film, but that, that moment when we see the cow's eye mm -hmm. and it's just, it's just kind of slowly kind of glazing over. Do you think that they really, because it looked like a real cow that was being butchered, which, which I mean, they could have got a cow that was already dead to butcher it in the film. Um, but I, I just found myself wondering if, if they really killed a cow in the movie or if they achieve that effect with the the eye of the cow doing what it did by giving it some kind of sedative maybe or something like that hmm. yeah uh, i don't know i guess i assumed that they must have um faked it somehow um but uh i, I mean I, I honestly don't know i would assume that they somehow got that scene without killing an actual cow but yeah I don't really know what to look for to know whether or not they did. And I didn't, yeah. I didn't, I didn't look at its Wikipedia page about whether they killed a real cow. It might say on the Wikipedia page, whether they. Yeah. yeah I'll be curious to know. Um, you know, come and yeah, see. I, haven't, I haven't seen a lot of films where, where animals are actually killed in the film. I've seen a handful. In uh, um, come and see in this, in the cow, in the scene with a cow and come and see the cow, they killed a real cow. Oh, did they really? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, where was that shot? Where was that filmed? Russia or Belarus, but the Soviet Union at the time. Gotcha. Yeah. And now, and I saw on the the Criterion thing about that movie that came out in the mid '80s, yeah. which would mean that in that part of the world, because um, uh, Tarkovsky did that in uh, in Andrei Rublev. There's a couple animals that are actually killed on screen in Andrei Rublev, and um, uh, so yeah, I mean, if if Come and See was made in the mid '80s. Um, yeah, it just means that Russia's Russia's not terribly interested in those kind of laws, yeah. at least at that point. I mean, I don't know if that's changed, but but yeah. They also uh, all the guns <coughs> you come and see are like real guns that are really being shot. <laughs> um, the 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 actor who played the main protagonist, his by the end of and they also um, they induced the actual feelings of shell shock at one point in both mm. him and the, and the, and the secondary actor. And um, so by the end of the shooting of the film, the main, the actor who played the main protagonist had lost a ton of weight and his hair had grayed. Interesting. Yeah. And he died at 50. That's really yeah, interesting. Which is pretty young. I don't know whether his, the Trump, the maybe trauma from filming that, from shooting that film, had like long-term impact and long-term impact on his health but yeah i don't know but 
You know, when I was reading about uh, Come and See today, when I saw that it was being released by Criterion and I let you know about it, the thing I found most interesting, the thing that made me want to see it the most was the fact that uh, uh, Richard Deakins was the cinematographer yeah. on Come and See. And, uh, and he's, he was the cinematographer on 1917 and on uh, Blade Runner 2049, Oh Brother Where Art Thou, like he's Skyfall. He's one of the best uh, directors of photography working in the movies. So that made me even more curious I mean, because he's probably, he might even be my favorite cinematographer actually. So that made me want to see, come and see uh, even more. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I would support that. <laughs> Um, yeah, he shot. Uh, I think. I think. For, I think Roger Deakins is the the cinematographer who shot uh, Scorsese's Kunden, hmm. um, which yeah, if you haven't seen Kunden, I've seen a single Scorsese see, film. You should see Kunden. What? I haven't seen. I haven't seen a single Scorsese film. Oh my God, the Yeah. Oh, we have to figure that out. And there's a bunch of them on Netflix right now, but they're mostly ones of his that I don't like very much. They're um, they're like his they're gangster, the, the gangster films. Stuff. They're like his gangster films or something. And yeah, um, I, I mean, you know, like The Godfather and such, like I have a hard time with films like that because the, I don't know, I, just, I have a harder time getting interested in those, I guess. Um, but The Last Temptation of Christ is on either like Stars or Showtime, one of the other streaming services. So yeah. maybe, yeah. I was actually yeah. thinking for, I was actually thinking possibly for maybe Midrash, I would read the Last Temptation of Christ, and then also watch the movie. So. Friend, um, yeah, look forward to next Wednesday. Yeah, me too. That'll be cool. I'm not sure how long that film is, but uh, but I'll look it up and I'll let you know what time we'll start the Zoom conference afterward. Cool. Awesome. Cool. All right. I'll see you. All right. Talk to you later, Lukash. <laughs>